Thomas John Watson was a farmer. Thomas Watson created this giant tech company. IBM today has an annual revenue of around $57.35 billion and has around 282,000 employees. Steve Jobs hated IBM as his company Apple was the biggest rival of IBM. Still, Steve Jobs copied IBM's Think slogan and Think Different was made Apple's slogan. After school, Thomas got a job as a teacher, but he did not enjoy it. He sold sewing machines. In 1899, NCR's leadership decided to reward Watson, giving him the NCR agency in Rochester. Watson and 27 other NCR leaders were convicted of anti-competitive sales practices and sentenced to a year in jail. An art lover, Watson generously supported the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He created IBM, which became the largest tech company of its time. Thomas John Watson was a farmer. He did not like his work, however, so he did a one-year course in business and accounting and became a bookkeeper. He was not very successful. As a simple farmer, math and numbers were not easy to understand, and within one year, he changed his career again and became a salesman. He had ups and downs until after 23 years, he founded a company called International Business Machines, which later became one of the largest tech companies for several decades. The company built computers so smart that they can beat renowned chess champion Garry Kasparov. IBM was so big that without its help, it was impossible for humankind to land on the moon. Yes, it was IBM whose computers helped NASA to track the orbital flights, which in turn made humans put a step on the moon. Steve Jobs hated IBM as his company Apple was the biggest rival of IBM. Still, Steve Jobs copied IBM's Think slogan and Think Different was made Apple's slogan. IBM from the very beginning invested a lot of resources in research and development. Today, it invests $6 billion every year in R&D. This research department's role cannot be undermined, where it developed the first floppy disks and hard disk drives, RAM, and relational databases. IBM today has an annual revenue of around $57.35 billion and has around 282,000 employees. Want to know how a farmer like Thomas Watson created this giant tech company? Watch the full video. We at Business Chronicles tell the stories of extraordinary successful people. Please subscribe to our channel to help us in making more videos. Thomas John Watson Sr. was born on February 17, 1874, in Campbell, New York. His parents were Thomas and Jane White Watson. Thomas was one of their five children. Thomas's father was a farmer. He also owned a lumber business around Painted Post, near Elmira. As a child, Thomas often worked on the family farm. He was quiet and kept to himself. He was also asthmatic. Thomas went to district school number five, and then, when he was a teenager, moved to Addison Academy. He grew up in the Methodist faith. After school, Thomas got a job as a teacher, but he did not enjoy it. In fact, he left after his first day. He followed this by taking an accounting and business course at the Miller School of Commerce in 1891. He graduated a year later in 1892 at the age of 18. After graduating, Thomas Watson found work as a bookkeeper at Clarence Riley's Market. He made $6 weekly. However, he did not last long in this position. A year later, he met with a traveling salesman named George Cornwell. The salesman sold pianos and organs to farmers for a local store. Watson joined Cornwell and became a salesman earning $10 a week. Watson worked with Cornwell for some time until the latter left. Watson remained in the position. Two years into his sale job, Watson learned that he could have been making $70 a week if he was paid on commission. This realization so stunned the young man that he resigned and moved to Buffalo, a metropolis. In Buffalo, Watson found work as a salesman for Wheeler & Wilson. He sold sewing machines. Unfortunately, one day he walked into a saloon and drank too much. When he left the establishment, he discovered that his horse, buggy, and sewing machine samples had been stolen. His employer fired him. It took Watson a year to get a new job, this time as a traveling salesman peddling shares of Buffalo Building and Loan Company. The young Watson found moderate success in this new job and even saved enough to start his own business, a butcher shop. Unfortunately, Watson's partner from the shares peddling work, C.B. Barron, ran away with a lot of his commission money. Watson was left broke and unemployed. Further, the cash strain he experienced hurt his investments, forcing him to close the butcher's shop. At his butcher's shop, Watson had a cash register he purchased from National Cash Register Corps, or NCR. Because he needed to negotiate a new repayment plan for the machine, he went to NCR's Buffalo office. There, he was so taken by the company that he decided he would join. The NCR Buffalo location Watson went to was under the management of John R. Range. When Watson asked Range for a job, he refused, but Watson was persistent. 
He kept returning to the location and asking for a job until finally, Range hired him as a sales apprentice in November of 1896. Watson was 22 years old at the time. In his early days working at NCR, Watson was poor at sales. Fortunately, Range took him under his wing and taught him how to sell well. Watson learned quickly, and soon he became the best salesman in the East, making a nice $100 a week. In 1899, NCR's leadership decided to reward Watson, giving him the NCR agency in Rochester. The territory was not desirable, and was actually one of the worst performing of NCR's 160 branches, but the role came with a 35% commission, which Watson found very enticing. He took up the assignment, and in a matter of months, he turned the Rochester agency to the sixth best for the NCR. He was later called up to the company's main offices in Dayton, Ohio. Watson's success at NCR, however, was not without blemish. His selling style was aggressive, just like his mentor, Range. His technique included knocking out his main competitor from business and intercepting the sales of other salesmen. Sometimes he even sabotaged the machines of competitors. While such rough techniques were common with salesmen at the time, they were not viewed well by authorities. In 1912, Watson was indicted in an antitrust suit. In February of 1913, a court found NCR guilty of breaching the Sherman Antitrust Act. Watson and 27 other NCR leaders were convicted of anti-competitive sales practices and sentenced to a year in jail. Watson and NCR's head, John Patterson, appealed their sentences. In a twist of fate, Dayton was ravaged by the floods of 1913. Many people lost their homes. NCR's plant, however, was protected as it was on high ground. Patterson and Watson opened the doors of the plant to local families and even helped scores of people in rescue operations. These events turned them into national heroes, making their convictions very unpopular. In 1915, the convictions were quashed in the appeal court on account of new evidence. In 1914, Watson was looking for a new job. While he got many offers, he was clear about the type of business he wanted to join. He wanted a controlling stake in a business and a share of the profits. He approached Charles Ranlett Flint, who had managed to consolidate five companies into Computing Tabulating Recording Company, or CTR. Flint hired Watson as general manager in 1914. A year later, once Watson's conviction was quashed, he was promoted to president. At the time of Watson's entry, CTR constituted several businesses, including International Time Recording, which manufactured clocks, and Computing Scale, which made scales and food slicers. International Time Recording was the moneymaker, bringing in $1 million in revenue for the group. The Computing Scale was not successful. CTR also made tabulators. Watson made it his goal to diversify the company's income streams. In 1915, at the end of Watson's first full year as president, CTR had 1,672 employees and $4 million in revenue. Net earnings then were $1 million. In the late 1910s, Watson focused on empowering his salesmen and streamlining operations. In 1915, he established his renowned Think philosophy, encouraging employees to be creative. That year, he also organized the company's first sales convention. In 1916, Watson laid the groundwork for what would be an education program for salesmen. In 1917, he led CTR into the Canadian market and acquired American Automatic Scale Co., which made heavy-duty scales. By 1919, CTR's revenues had more than doubled to $11 million. Employees had reached 3,139. In the 1920s, Watson diversified the company's products even further. He introduced the printing tabulator in 1920, the first electric key punch in 1923, a self-regulating time system in 1924, an automatic gang punch in 1927, and a public address and program signaling system for schools in 1928. In that decade, Watson also changed the company's name from CTR to International Business Machines, today known as IBM, in 1924. Watson further expanded IBM's reach, opening a plant in Germany in 1924, offices in the Philippines and France in 1925, and a plant in England in 1929. In that same year, IBM's revenues hit $18 million. Net earnings were $7 million, and their employees numbered 5,999. In the 1930s, despite the mass layoffs that followed the Great Depression, Watson kept his employees. His company survived thanks to a series of government contracts he was able to secure. That decade, IBM made good acquisitions including the International Scale Company in 1930 and Electromatic Typewriters Inc. in 1933. Watson also introduced new machines and perks to cushion employees. The new machines included a numeric printing tabulator that could tabulate 150 cards a minute in 1933, an electric typewriter in 1935, and an alphabetic interpreter in 1937. 
The employee perks included salaries for all factory employees and group life insurance in 1934 and holiday pay in 1937. In 1939, IBM revenues hit $38 million and net earnings at $9 million. It had 11,315 employees. In the 1940s, Watson dedicated IBM's facility to the U.S. government to help in World War II. The company made more than 36 items, including bombs, engine parts, and rifles. The war years also saw IBM make strides towards computing with the completion of the automatic sequence-controlled calculator in 1944 and the selective sequence electronic calculator in 1948. Watson became the company's chairman in 1949. That year, the company made $183 million in revenue and $33 million in net earnings. It employed 27,236 people. In the 1950s, Watson presided over a number of key technological product innovations at IBM, including the first computer-based vacuum tube in 1952. Watson retired from IBM in 1956, leaving his son Thomas Watson Jr. in charge. That year, IBM brought in $892 million in revenue and $87 million in net earnings. Employees totaled 72,504. Watson served as chair of the International Chamber of Commerce in 1937. Watson was also a trustee of Columbia University and Lafayette College. In the 1940s, he sat on the National Executive Board of Boy Scouts of America. An art lover, Watson generously supported the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He even served as a trustee of the Met for 20 years and was its vice president from 1945 to 1951. Watson died on June 19th of 1956 at the age of 82. Thomas Watson is a legend. No one had ever thought that he'd be the one to create the first tech company. He was born to a farmer, but like many great achievers, he did not like his work and wanted to do something big. He had no idea how to achieve his goal, but he went to bookkeeping, which at the beginning was not a very good idea. He slowly rose through the ranks, and once he was able to achieve some success in the later parts of his life, he created IBM, which became the largest tech company of its time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to watch more videos like this.